God this morning. Hallelujah. Good to see everyone. Amen. Hallelujah. It's been God's house. Amen. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand of words forevermore. Amen. We'll be on our feet if we can. Amen. That you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign? Won't you reign in me again? That's our prayer this morning. That God will reign in us. Over every thought, over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. You mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me? you reign in me, Lord reign, Lord reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, and in my darkest hour you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign, so won't you reign in me. For the last time, Lord reign, Lord reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Amen. What a wonderful God we serve. What a glorious Savior we serve. And this morning, we're going to celebrate the fact that God is good amen hallelujah we're going to sing that song together god is good amen hallelujah amen hallelujah we serve a good god this morning a wonderful savior he's the same today yesterday and forever hallelujah so let's sing together god is
for your goodness. Thank you for the cross, God. Hallelujah. Amen. He came to my rescue. We serve God this morning. And when we call, He comes to our rescue. And I want to be where you are. Hallelujah. Let's sing together. Falling on my knees. Falling on my knees.
Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We praise you that when we call, you answer. That, Father, you come to our rescue, God. We appreciate you. We bless you this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, praise and worship team. Saints, we're going to go into a time of prayer this morning. I want us to bring our needs, to bring our requests before God, to let God know what's on our hearts this morning. Please don't feel you've got to come in a religious way and all the fancy words. Just let God know what's on your heart this morning morning i want us to pray for souls to be saved that's what we're really contending for the miracle of seeing souls saved pray for huddersfield i want us also to remember leeds that amazing city of leeds we want to go see god move across yorkshire we want to see souls saved and people turn into jesus amen as we pray this morning i'm going to ask my brother cordell if he would open us up in prayer this morning all the way from Leeds. Amen. Brother Cordell, if you could please open us in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we just want to give you thanks as we congregate together this morning. Lord God, we're just praying, God, for your presence, Lord, as we come to hear your word, Lord. God, I pray that you will minister, God, into hearts in this place, Lord. God, I pray that you will speak into our lives, give us the direction that we need, Lord. God, we're just praying, God, for the city, God, of Huddersfield. We're praying, God, that you will continue, God, a wonderful work, Lord, that you'll be drawing people, God, and touching hearts and souls, God. God, we're praying, God, that we'll see, God, people make decisions for you, God, in this town, Lord. God, that we'll see people, God, that are destined, God, to be preachers, that are destined to be pillars, Lord, that are destined to do powerful things in your name. Lord God, we're praying, God, for true conversions, God, not religious ones, Lord. We're praying for people, God, who are going to have an impact, Lord. For there are people out there right now, Lord, that are looking for answers, God, that are lost, God, that need you, Lord, that need God to be touched by you. And we're praying, God, that you'll use, God, your people, God, to reach them, Lord. Lord God, we pray for God for the least church. We're praying, God, as you prepare a man, God. We're praying, God, that you will send someone, Lord God, that will have the fire, the seal, Lord God, to touch, God, the city of Lees, God. God, that will see, God, marvelous things happen in your name, Lord. God, we know, God, that you have a great destiny, God, for that city, Lord. And we pray we'll see it come to fruition, Lord. God, we're praying for those who may have backslidden, Lord. Those who are turned away, we're believing for you, God, to move, God, and draw them back unto you, Lord. Lord, let them be reunited with you Lord God we pray God that you will touch those God who need healing Lord those God who are suffering in sickness God we're believing for miracles we're believing for your blood we're believing God that we'll see God people completely restored God who are struggling in health Lord God for you are a miracle worker God and your blood brings healing Lord God we pray you'll continue to use God Pastor John and Sister Jane God in the city God of Huddersfield we believe God that you'll continue Continue to give them the vision God the passion the zeal God God that you will continue to help them to lead Lord and draw people unto you God as they remain God a testimony and example Lord God we just pray God you will continue to fill them with fire Lord God we pray that you will move God amongst God the Yorkshire in general Lord and we believe in God for Wakefield we're believing for the new churches that you have launched we're believing for Doncaster we believe in God that you will continue to spread we pray God that you will continue to use God this ministry Lord God to touch God your people God and to see people restored Lord we want to lift you up this morning in the mighty name of Jesus Lord we want to give you all the praise God as you are worthy Lord and we just want to give you thanks God that we can come together Lord together as one to worship you God to hear your word Lord to be directed in God to be restored God we believe and give you thanks this morning in the mighty name of Jesus Lord Amen. Turn around and greet one another this morning.
Praise God. You're all welcome to um, church this morning. It's good to see everyone. Um, our announcement this morning, our morning prayer in church um, continues. We started, I think, last month or so. Um, the church is open between 7 and 8 a.m. for anybody that wants to come to church just to um, pray in the morning before going to work or going about your daily activities. Um, just encourage you if you can to come and just pray and um, you can also use that maybe as a form of your um, personal devotion and just come to church and pray to God praise God um, our prayer um, also continues in church on Wednesdays uh, between 7 and 8 p.m. Um, also available via zoom for those that can make it um, to church we usually send out the link um, to people. Also, we have a church WhatsApp group for anybody that would like um, to be in that group just so you can get church updates and church announcements. You can talk to Brother Jackson after the service. How many of us know that God answers prayers? Yeah, so um, Wednesdays at church are your opportunity. If you know and you're sure that God answers prayers, you have that opportunity either on in the mornings, Monday to Friday or, or Wednesdays, just to come to church, to lay your request before God, to bear your heart uh, before God. And I know that God will meet each and every one of us at our point of needs in Jesus' name. Bible studies um, continues again on Friday um, at 7.30 p.m. So we've been looking at the ministry of John the Baptist. Um, the title of the series is Preparing the Way. Um, like I said uh, before, I think I mentioned it last week, that Bible study is interactive. You have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, you have an opportunity to share your thoughts and opinions. And um, generally, we just learn from each other. And it's interesting because, you know, pastor at Bible study is more or less like, you know, it comes to our level and... Um, breaks things down for us properly and that's an opportunity for you to come also to learn at God's feet and um, just to educate yourself on the word of God so Fridays 7.30 p.m. Um, looking at the ministry of John the Baptist and I hope I'll see everyone there this Friday praise God um, exciting news I would like us to clap our outreach and gospel concert is coming up Saturday, the 23rd of July. And um, Bolton is coming all the way to support us. Um, promises to be an exciting time in God's presence. Please let us rep others field. If the guys are coming all the way from Bolton, we should um, let them know that, you know, we run this city. So, yeah, please, let's try. Um, and participate. So the itinerary for that is um, Saturday, 23rd of July for your calendars. Uh, we'll be meeting at church to pray by 11 a.m. And, um, you know, breakfast would also be served so we'd have enough energy before going into town. So we'll meet at church by 11, we'll pray, we'll take breakfast. Then we'll be on the streets, literally on the streets of Othersfield from 12.30 till 3.30 p.m. Um, playing music, um, you know, the last time we had some guys that came to rap, um, preaching the word of God. Um, if you are a poet and you have Christian poems too, you can just be, <laughs> be in the town and just, you know, it's just an opportunity just to reach out to people, just to let them know what we are enjoying in God's kingdom and to invite them and encourage them to come under the banner of Christ and just enjoy his love. So we'll be on the streets from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. Then we'll come back to church. We'll would have lunch. And um, from 5.30, the concert would start. And I'm particularly looking forward to that. Um, the guys from Bolton, Bolton will be performing. Um, others feel them. Potter's House, others feel the choir. Choir will be performing. I hope the guys would... <laughs> I'm just telling them now so they would know. So, yeah, so 
I'm encouraging everybody also to just put that date in your calendar and plan to attend. Um, the singles seminar um, is, come, is approaching so fast, um, August 13th. Um, anyone that is interested should please um, reach out to Brother Gary, he's in charge of this program. Um, married people for now are uh, prohibited from attending. <laughs> it's just for single people or probably people that are also in courtship. Um, promises to be an interesting time um, just to tell you about how you need to guard your relationship under the Christian principles and um, tips also for those that are single and are looking to um, get into relationships, what you need to know. So I would encourage you, um, the single people in courtship, um, to reach out to Brother Gary. Um, as an incentive, the church would also be covering the expenses to go for this. So the earlier you let us know, the better we can make arrangements. Praise God. Um, those are my announcements for now. If any other thing comes up, I'll let you know before the service um, closes. And um, if you have any questions or um, you need to know where the toilet is or you have any inquiries, just reach out to any of the guys, Jackson, Ibuka, or Gary, and I'm sure they will be able to help you out. Amen. I'll just invite them, Pastor, to proceed. Amen. We're going to take an offering uh, this morning. And, you know, with the offering as a church, we don't tend to make too much of a fuss about the offering. You know, David would usually mention that you're under no obligation to give. But I also believe that as, as, a, as a pastor, it's one of my duties to make sure that we're in line with God's principles, with what the Bible tells us and you know with it with tithes and you might if you're new to church and you think what is a tithe the tithe is 10 percent of your increase if you have an income you know it's 10 percent of your of your increase of, of god what god has blessed you with and tithing and giving an offering it's a trust issue the question is do you trust god a christian went to india it, i think he was on a mission trip to india and in India, you know, India is a highly populated country, and sadly, there's a lot of poverty in India. So on the streets of, of many cities in India, you have street beggars, and they're literally on, you know, begging for alms. They, 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 they can't have employment, or they're stricken with disease, and all they can do is beg for money. And so this, this Christian on this trip, he sees this beggar, and he wants to bless this man with a lot of money. Uh, you know, he's, 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 he's walking around, he's probably got about $100, and he just says, I want to bless this beggar with about $100, which is insane amounts of money in India if you convert that. And so he walks up to the beggar and says, you know, I, I want to give you some money. He brings out the money, he's got these, this wad of notes in his hand. The beggar's eyes widen, he thinks, I'm, for the month, I'm sorted here. But the Christian says to him, I see you've been getting all these pennies and what, and I tell you what, give me all the money you've collected today, and I will give you a hundred dollars. And the beggar thinks, that's a no-brainer, you know, he's only collected all these pennies, we're not even up to a dollar, and he begins to gather his pennies, and he's about to give them to this Christian, and at the very last moment, he holds back. He's like, hold on, this is too good to be true. Why do you want my pennies in exchange for a hundred? Hold on, is this a scam? And he's looking at him and he, he suddenly withdraws. And the Christian tells him, no, honestly, I'm, I'm being serious. You give me your pennies, which less than a dollar, and I will give you a hundred dollars. And this beggar holds back and refuses. The Christian is with a guide. He says to the guide, you know, tell this man I'm a trustworthy man. He can trust me. The guide speaks to him in, in his language and he says he can be trusted. He's a Christian. He wants to bless you. But first of all, he needs you to just release all these coins you've got. Just give them to him. Let him bless you with $100. And the beggar holds on and refuses because he doesn't trust this Christian. And many times we're like that. God says to us, 
you're holding on to the tithe which belongs to me. Give me the tithe. It's, it's like that one dollar. Give that to me. It's mine. I own the tithe. But we're like, I don't trust you, God. Maybe it's a scam. Maybe, maybe this tithe and offering thing, maybe it's not. And there are things God wants to bless you with, way and beyond the tithe. It's an issue of trust. With Abraham, it was his son Isaac. And many times God will bring you to that place. And many times it's with our finances. Do you really trust me? Yes, we lift our hands in worship and, oh God, I love you and you've come to my rescue. But the tithe is an opportunity to say, I trust you, God. And I'm going to let go of this penance that I have and allow you give me the blessings that you have for me. In Malachi 3, he says, test me in this release the tithe and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing upon you, you won't be able to contain it. It's an issue of trust. And I challenge you this morning, let's trust God as we give our tithes and our offerings. We're going to sing a song, but before that we'll pray. I'll ask Brother Sam to please bless the gift and the giver this morning. Amen. Sam, thank you. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to sing a song, Live Jesus Higher. Brother Ibuka will pass the baskets. Thank you. Amen. We'll sing that song together. Amen. Live Jesus Higher. Lift him up for the world to see. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all down to me. Live Jesus Higher. Live Jesus Higher. Lift him up for the world to see. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Oh, lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Lift Jesus high, lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to God. For the last time, lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. I will draw all men unto me. I will draw all men unto me. Amen. Let's give it up for the praise and worship team. Hey. Well done, guys. Amen. Right, church, we're in for a treat this morning. We have preaching royalty amongst us. <laughs> we're, we're blessed today and honored, honored really to have uh, Pastor Steve and Ruth heard with us this morning. I, I'm going to embarrass Steve just a bit with a, with a bit of an introduction. So, oh, that's Steve, that's them in picture, but that's them in living color. <laughs> that's the live version. <laughs> So, Pastor Steve and Ruth, um, Steve has an amazing testimony. I'm gonna, he's going to weave it into his sermon this morning, but he's got an amazing testimony. But Steve uh, and his wife, Ruth, they pioneered the Ark Church in Huddersfield in 2010. I'm, ho I'm hoping I get all my dates right. There's a few dates. But prior to that, let's go back in time a bit. They had pioneered a city church in York in 1999-2000, so Steve has been preaching over 20 years, or church planting for over 20 years. Uh, it, so that was in 99-2000, they pioneered City Church in York. Um, they were there, and in 2008, they felt called by God to start a work in Huddersfield. 
uh, and there was a time of prayer and planning and preparation for that over about two years. I mean, in 2010, September 2010, they started the Ark Church uh, at Greenhead College in Huddersfield, uh, and they, they've taken that church on to amazing heights. Um, and, you know, just last year, uh, Steve handed over the reins. I know he looks really young, but, <laughs> but Steve felt it was time to hand over the reins of, that, of leadership of the church, and that's now been led by Pastor Andy, but Steve still serves at the Ark Church as an elder, and he's a, he's a man of God. He has a heart for evangelism. One of the reasons I asked Steve to preach for us today is because Steve is an evangelist at heart. He, he, he wants to see people saved. He, he's, he's got a burden for Yorkshire, and they've planted a church into Halifax. He himself is from Barnsley, born and bred. <laughs> And they're actually helping a couple plant a church in Barnsley right now as well. So he's a man after God's heart. He's got a passion for the gospel. And I'm just praying that that is infectious, that we're just, it's a contagious thing that catches most of us today. But please, let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Steve Hurd as he comes and ministers for us this morning. Steve, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, God. Well, welcome. <laughs> Uh, from the Ark Church uh, in Huddersfield. You be wondering why we called the church the Ark Church. Anybody? In, oh, I see a hand at the back there. I wasn't expecting it. Was that me? Sorry. Who, who can tell me where in the Bible it talks about an ark? Noah's Ark. Very good. Noah's Ark. And Noah's Ark was a place where people and the whole creation came to be saved. So I'm thinking to myself, that's a good name for a church. I want our church to be a place where people get saved. Now, it gets a bit harder. Who can tell me where there's another ark in the Bible? Anybody? Ooh. The Ark of the Covenant. That was the place where God lived, if you like, where the people went to meet with God and God uh, met over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. People went to meet and experience the power and the presence of God. So I'm thinking, that's a good name for a church. Uh, I, want a, I want a church where people meet with the power and the presence of God. Now this is where it might get a bit tricky. Can anybody tell me about any other Arks in the Bible? See, everybody thinks there's two arcs in the Bible. But actually, there's another one. So you know when Moses was a baby? Yeah, and he was going to be killed by Pharaoh. And Moses' mother placed the baby Moses in a, in, a, in a basket. And it floated in the river. That word basket, it's the same Hebrew word translated ark. So we read basket, but really it's the same word as the ark, Noah's ark. It really, need, it really means a box, that's what it means. And, and Moses was protected and kept safe in that little ark, that basket. And I thought, well, that's a great name for a church as well. A place where people get saved, a place where people come to meet with the presence of God, and a place where people feel the presence and the safety and are protected. Uh, by God. So we're from the Ark Church. I it's great to be here this morning. It's such an honour to be here this morning. See your passion uh, for the town of Huddersfield and indeed Yorkshire. So we're part of a, a family of churches. I was chatting to uh, Cordell. We have a church uh, over in Leeds as well uh, in, our, in our family of churches. A uh, church in uh, Harrogate, two churches in York where Ruth and I used to be, a church in Sheffield, Bradford and uh, we're looking to start a church in Halifax and also in, in Barnsley as well. But our passion uh, is Yorkshire, but for this town of Huddersfield. And it's great uh, to get to know John a little bit. So some of us who are pastors, leaders of the churches in the town, we meet together for prayer and for fellowship and to do 
just to do things together. Uh, so myself and a couple of other guys started what we call Hope Huddersfield, uh, Hope for Huddersfield, uh, a few years ago, back in 2010, when we arrived in the town, just to be together. It's so good to do things together, and we've done all sorts of things together over the years, and we're going to continue to do that. So it's great uh, to be here with you this morning. Now, I'm going to read from the scriptures. Uh, I want to get right into it from uh, the second book of Corinthians and uh, chapter 5, uh, one of my favorite uh, passages in the, in the scriptures, 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. And I'm going to start reading at verse 14. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 14. And Paul says this, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Hallelujah. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Chapter 6, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says... In the time of my favour, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that in your word is everything that we need. Everything we need for life for righteousness, everything that we need for this town of Huddersfield, for this county of Yorkshire, for this nation, everything that we need. Thank you for your word and your spirit. Holy Spirit, bring your word alive amongst us here this morning. Even as I speak, Holy Spirit, would you come and work in the hearts of my brothers and sisters here this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this, uh, this sermon has uh, the title of Get Right with God. Getting right with God. And I've called it that because it just shouts out from this passage. It's the most important thing about this passage, about getting right with God. It's the most important thing in all of our lives, in my life, in your life. It's, it's more important than anything else in your life. Anything else that's going on. It's more important than the cost of living. It's more important than who's going to be the next Prime Minister. Lord, help us. It's more important than the, 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 the pandemic, the COVID infection rates. It's more important than what we're going to have to eat when we get home in a few hours. No, I'm not going to preach for that long, don't worry. <laughs> It, it's, it's more important than uh, my health, your health, our family's health. It, 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 it's just so important. Getting right with God. The most important 
thing in my life is that I'm right with God. That, I, that there's no conflict between me and God. There's nothing barring me, standing me against my relationship with God. God. Now, in, in the passage here, Paul doesn't use the term get right with God. He uses the word reconciled. Reconciled. To be reconciled with God. And he, he verses in verse uh, 18. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So he's talking about reconciliation. But that's a long word. Reconciled. It's a long word. And I'm a Yorkshireman, okay? And, and we, we, we don't tend to use the word reconciled very much. We talk about getting right, getting things sorted out. Or in actual fact, we might say in Barnsley, where I grew up, Instead of be reconciled to God, we'd probably say something like, get this end rate with God, lad. Get this end rate with God. All right, can we have a bit of participation here? After me, get this end, this end, right? Rate, rate with God. Get this end rate with God. You got that, John? We'll, we'll turn you into a Yorkshireman, yeah. Get this end rate with God. Reconcile. I looked up the word reconciled in the dictionary. I think I knew what it meant, but I thought I'd check, okay? To be reconciled, it means to make yourself no longer opposed to someone or, or somebody. It means to become friendly with someone after estrangement or after you've had a fallout, okay? To, to make peace with someone. It means to re-establish friendly relations, with, with, with someone. It means to make, this is a good one, to make two apparently conflicting things compatible with each other. To make two things that are conflicting compatible with each other. You see, the Bible tells us that in my natural state, me and God are incompatible. <laughs> we, are, we are incompatible. We, we have to be separated. There has to be an alienation between me and God. Because God is holy and pure and I am not. <laughs> that, that is what the, 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 the Bible tells us. The, the stuff in my life, the sin in my life, the things that I do that I shouldn't do and the things that I don't do that I should do, all of that stuff, separates me from a God who is holy and pure. So I am I'm separated from God. We are, if you like, at conflict. Now, often you hear preachers tell you that God loves you. Yeah, he does. God, God loves me, and I know that, but he don't like the st stuff that goes on in me. God loves me, he does not like my sin. And if God is to remain holy and pure, he can't have anything to do with me because I am not. He, he, he just can't. Yeah, you might say, yeah, but God loves you, Steve. Yeah, he does, but his holiness, his justice demands that that stuff in me, my, my sin, must separate me from God. So I can't have that relationship with God. That's why... Paul talks about the need to be reconciled with God, to get right with God. But the Bible tells us that I, I, I can't get right with God except through Jesus and except through the blood of Jesus. That Jesus, Paul, we'll look at this in a, in a moment. Paul says Jesus on the cross was reconciling me 
to God, making it possible for me to be right with God. And we'll look at that in a moment, the the good news of the gospel. But brothers and sisters, the, the gospel is only good news is because of the bad news. (laughs) we're sometimes very very good at telling people the good news but hey unless you tell people the bad news the good news may not look that good The, the, the good news is only good because the bad news is so bad so we have to make sure people hear the bad news so that then they can appreciate just how good is the good news And the bad news is, is that on my own, in my natural state, without Jesus, I'm I'm separated from God. There's a hostility between me and God because of the stuff in my life. So the question this morning from this passage is, how does a man or a woman get right with God? How, How can we be reconciled with God? We'll look at what Paul says in a moment, but I, I didn't get reconciled with God until I was 34 years old, so just a few years ago. But um, I was, I, you see, I, I wasn't brought up in a, in a Christian family, a religious family, a church-going family. There was none of that, really, in my, in my family history. Um, I remember when I was a kid, about five or six, my sister, my big sister, would sometimes drag me off to church on a Sunday morning and we had to uh, go down to this big, dark, foreboding building, uh, church on a Sunday morning. And um, at first I was scared. I, I was quite scared. Especially when all, the, all these, these men in long robes came walking in. And one of them would, would have a long um, silver chain with a ball on the end. And he would wave it around and all this poison gas used to come out. And it used to get up my nostrils and I used to think, ah! I was scared, man. <laughs> I didn't realise at the time it was incense. And I'm happy with a bit of incense now, that's fine. But no one explained to me about incense perhaps ushering in the presence of God. By the way, we don't do incense at the art church, but who knows? (laughs) But I I was scared. And then then after a while, I just got bored. I just got bored with the whole setup and started to vote with my feet. Didn't go to church anymore. Uh, By the time I went off to uh, university, where I met my beautiful wife, uh, Ruth, I was a um, convinced and convicted atheist. And I loved talking to Christians. Oh, I loved talking to Christians and asking them all the questions that they struggled to answer about this God. You see, I thought that it was just a fairy story. I thought Christianity uh, was for people who couldn't cope with life. Perhaps for weak people. And if you were a man and you were a Christian, oh my goodness, what a wimp. You know, and you probably played the guitar with a multicolored strap. So, no, we haven't got any more. Do you you know what I mean? And and wore and wore those brown open toe sandals with socks. You know, and 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 that was my that was my picture of, of a of a Christian man, someone who just wasn't in the real world. I was a Yorkshireman. Yeah, you know, I wanted something firm and solid. If you could feel it and touch it. Then I believed in it. None of this airy, fairy, spiritual nonsense. Um, Ruth and I met, as I said, we, uh, we got married. Uh, and Ruth had a little bit more of a church-going background to her family life than I did. And um, she would sometimes go off to church on Sunday. And I always remember one Sunday morning she came uh, back from church. We were living in Billericay in Essex. And uh, Ruth came back from church on a Sunday morning and she said to me, I've become a Christian. So my first response was, you know, I thought the Moonies or some weird cult or sect had got her or something, you know. Uh, But then I thought, well, 
I thought you already were. And, and, and she said something along the lines of, well, so did I, but I wasn't, but now I am. And uh, it didn't mean much to me at all. I wasn't the least bit interested. Um, I remember for quite a while, a few years, Ruth used to leave little, little booklets lying around the house, little tracks. Back in those days, there were these little green booklets called Knowing God Personally. And she would leave them lying around the house, hoping that I would pick it up and read it. And I was determined that I was never going to pick this up and read it. You know, and uh, it, there it would be on the coffee table. She was determined she wasn't going to move it till I had. I was determined I was never going to read it, so the coffee table got very dusty. And, and these leaf, I mean, I, I think I remember once I sort of picked it up and had a sneak view inside and then put it back down so she didn't know I'd looked at it. And um, this went on, but um, the church that Ruth was, was, was going to, um, the curate there at the church was a guy called Paul, and he took uh, uh, an interest in, in wives who, whose husbands were not in the church. And he uh, obviously did his homework on me and found out that I was passionate about sport. Okay, so I still am, love sport. I uh, used to play a lot, uh, don't do so much these days. Uh, but um, he found out I was passionate about sport. And um, one day uh, he came around the house, I think it was, or I started to sit at the back of the church helping Ruth take the kids to church, you know what it's like on a Sunday morning, getting everybody dressed up and to church on time. And I was sat at the back scowling at anybody who came anywhere near me, you know, to talk to me. And uh, Paul came up and got talking. He said, uh, how about a game of squash, Steve? How about playing a game of squash? So I know this is difficult to imagine. In those days, I was very fit, okay? <laughs> very active. And there, there was this, this vicar, you know, sort of, well, he was a vicar, you know, come on, <laughs> asking me to play him at squash. And I thought, no. Nah. Anyway, every, you know, several times he came and asked me to play squash. So eventually I condescended to play the vicar at squash. And we played squash, we turned up, and I, I don't know if you know the game squash. I stood in the middle of the court, you know, sort of knocking the ball around, and he was running around, scraping to get it back, sweating profusely. You know, and I was just sort of there, whatever. The, the, the game of squash, it, let's just say it, it didn't tax me too. I was very proud in those days. So we kept uh, playing squash. And um, one day in the changing room afterwards, he, he reached into his bag and he pulled out a book. And it was a book. He said, Steve, I'd love you to read this book. He said, it's called Who Moved the Stone? And it was about the resurrection of Jesus. Who moved the stone? He said, I'd love you to read this book. I said, Paul, happy to play at squash. No way I'm reading your book. End of story. Play squash again the next week. Sure enough, reaches into his bag, the book comes out. Steve, I've still got the book here. So I'm saying it must be getting a bit sweaty and whatever now with your squash gear. But I've still got the book, Steve. Like, no, I don't want to read the book. Every week he would bring the book out. Steve, I'd love you to read the book. He was persistent. He wore me down. So eventually I, I came up with a master plan. I said, Paul... The day you beat me at squash, then I'll read your book. I thought, ah, that's it. It's never going to happen. Blow me down if our squash games didn't start to get a little bit competitive. I had to start moving. I had to start running. It got to the point that I was sweating. And we, I was determined he was never going to beat me. But he was equally determined he was, so I would read his flipping book. <laughs> One morning, we got changed. We were walking down towards the court, squash court. This incredibly fit-looking guy, who I sussed out was the squash coach at the sports centre, comes down the corridor. Paul is walking past, high five with the squash coach. Squash coach says, this is the day. Go get him. And I'm thinking... What? Hang on a minute, he's taking squash, this guy's taking squash lessons. He's so determined I'm going to read his book. He never did beat me, but I had to move house just to make sure. No, I, we, we did move house for my work, a different thing. And I, I, Ruth seems to think he did, be, and I'm sure he never be, beat me. I, I eventually read his book many years later, and it's a great book. But... I didn't read it at the time, but I always remember thinking, 
Why is he so determined to get me to read this book? Why? That, that, that made me think a little bit. But we did have to move house. We moved to a different part of the country, up to the Midlands for my work. Um, Ruth got involved in another church, and again, I would go along to help with the kids, sit at the back, scowling. And uh, there was another curate there. This time his name was Arthur. And Arthur discovered that this thing wasn't as passion in my life as sport was. But, you see, when I was a kid, I grew up in a, in a, in a pub. My, my mum and dad ran a public house. And the rumour has it is that my mum used to put a few drops of Tetley Bitter in my bottle with my milk to send me to sleep at night. I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, I, I grew up and I quite liked to have a, a drink of beer. Not get drunk, but have a drink of beer. So Paul found this out and found out that that was the case with a few other missing husbands in the church. So, so sorry, Arthur. So Arthur comes up to me one Sunday morning and says, Steve, I want to invite you round my house on Friday night to ail an argument. I said, what? He said, ail an argument. You guys bring the ale, I'll bring the argument. We'll have a good night. So I'm thinking to myself, well, this can't be anything too bad, you know. Go around the, someone's house and have a, have a beer and, you know, have a discussion. And sure enough, we did that. Uh, did that regularly every Friday night. There was about five or six of us. We would turn up at the vicar's house and uh, he would introduce some sort of argument, discussion about God, Jesus, the church, whatever. He'd have a mate with him, but there'd always be four, five, six of us, so we'd always win the argument. And we'd go out at the end of the night after an hour or so, sort of high fives. Yeah, we, we won the argument. We beat the vicar again. You know, it was only years later Many years later, I suddenly thought, he wasn't bothered about winning the argument. He got four or five guys who weren't believers around his house on a Friday night talking about God. <laughs> talking about Jesus. And, um, I mean, slowly but slowly, God was using these men to be what Paul calls in our passage there, ambassadors for Christ. See, I love my wife to bits, but there was no way she was going to lead me to Christ. Because as well, well as being proud, I was probably sexist as well, you know. I needed to see Christian men being men. Men who I couldn't pin that wimp label on. And God sent these guys to be ambassadors to me with a message. The, the turning point for me really was when one of these Friday night sessions and I was arguing away about this, that and the other in my arrogance and whatever. And one of these guys turned to me and said, Steve, you call yourself a historian because I, I did history when I was at university at Newcastle where Ruth and I met. And I love history, still do. He says, you call yourself a historian and he said, you've never checked out the evidence about Jesus Christ. You've never looked at the facts of the Bible and that really annoyed me because <laughs> he was challenging me on my own turf you see because I, I prided myself on evidence and facts so I set out to prove him wrong I went out to check the evidence and the facts and, and, and prove him wrong I wanted to go back to him and guess what happened I couldn't <laughs> Because the more I looked, the more I found evidence. The more I, I searched, the more I found that Christianity is a historical faith. Oh yeah, we, we worship a supernatural, powerful God. But our faith is built on historical evidence. Facts. The fact of Jesus Christ. No serious historian would ever would ever try to argue that Jesus didn't exist based on facts, on evidence. And the more archaeological and other research that we do, the more and more the evidence for Christianity builds up. Now, we don't think ourselves into being a Christian. There's faith required. We take a step of faith. But for me, it wasn't a blind leap into the dark. It was a step of faith 
from a reasoned view. And eventually I got to the point, I got invited to a, a Billy Graham event, and then I went to a, 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 a music concert uh, at the NEC in Birmingham on the 20th of October 1989. I don't really know what I was doing there. I was on my own. The hall was filled. There were 10,000 seats. I was sat next to an empty seat and the other 9,998 were full of Christians. I'm pretty sure the way they were all singing and worshipping and whatever. I think I was the only not Christian in the place. But there came a point where the guy on the platform said, turn to the person next to you and the two in front of you or behind you and form a four and pray with them. So I'm going, oh. You know, and it was even worse because there was no one sat next to me, and then in front of me, two teenage girls turned around. And I'm going, Oh, they're gonna know I'm an imposter, I shouldn't be here. But they didn't say anything, they just started to pray. And I always remember thinking, They started to pray to Jesus as if He was sat on the empty seat next to me. And I thought, this is, this is strange. They're, they're not praying to God as if he's, I don't know, up there somewhere. They're, they're praying to, to God as if he's here. As if he's, if he's right here with us. And then all of a sudden, the penny dropped. I remember thinking, hang on. If the resurrection is true, if that book that Paul wanted me to read those years ago about who moved the stone, the resurrection of Jesus. If, if, that's true, if Jesus is alive, then it all makes sense. <laughs> if, if that one thing is true, all my other doubts and everything else means nothing. If that one thing is true. If Jesus is alive in the spirit today, if he's here with us today, that answers every question. All the other questions, they're secondary issues. They're moot points. They're, they're, they're of no significance if Jesus is alive today. And at the end of the prayer time, the band struck up again and everybody was singing and worshipping. But I was at the back of the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham, 20th October 1989 at 10 minutes to 10. And I became what Paul describes in verse 17, a new creation. 20th October, 1989, at 10 minutes to 10, I became a new creation. And you know what? I didn't know how to pray. My prayer was something along the lines of, God, I give up. <laughs> God, I just give up trying to prove that you're not real. I give up trying to prove that all this is, is just not true. I just give up. And if you're real, God then forgive me and will you come into my heart and will you, the, the prayer was something like, will you prove to me that you are real and this is real? And all I can tell you is that God did that. He came into my heart. He proved himself to me. God was real. He made me what Paul calls here in verse 17, a new creation. A new creation. How did it happen? Paul tells us here, verse 21. Verse 21. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for me, so that in him I might be right with God. On the cross, Jesus was reconciling me and you to God through Christ. He took my sin and he placed it on Jesus. The thing as I said earlier, that was keeping me away from God was my sin. But on the cross, Jesus took my sin 
and dealt with it once and for all. And because my sin was dealt with by Jesus on the cross, it's not there anymore. There's now no barrier between me and God. That thing that kept me separated has been dealt with by Jesus. And that is how I became a new creation. And that is how people are saved into the church. Look at verse 19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. He does, when I go to God now, he doesn't count my sin against me. Because Jesus sorted it out on the cross. This is the grace of God. And it's because he loves me. It's not because of anything I do. All I did was to accept that he has done it. You see, I, I sometimes, you know, sometimes it seems to me people think that Christianity is, is spelt do, you know, I must do this and I must do that, I must do the other, I must be a good man, I must do this right, I must read the Bible, I must pray, I must go to, I must do, 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 do. But Christianity is not spelt D-O, it's spelt D-O-N-E, done. It's not what must, I have to do, it's what's been done. It's not about the things that I do, it's about what Jesus has already done for me. And the only thing I need to do is to accept that Jesus has already done it. He paid the price on the cross for my sin. The grace of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And if this morning you know that you're not right with God. It's so important that you leave this place before you walk through that door knowing that you are right with God. And you can do that. You can do that. You can make things right between you and God by accepting that Jesus did that on the cross. That he paid the price for you on the cross. And, you know, many of you, you, you are believers, you are Christians, but, you know, it's so easy for us to just to slip so that there's something niggling away, something that's not quite right between us and God. Get right with God this morning, whatever it is. Sort it with God this morning. Be fully reconciled to God this morning. Get right with God. But that's not the end. Because God says in this passage, verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal to us. You see, this, this offer of forgiveness, this offer of being right with God, that God offers to everyone, not just those of us here, but everyone out there. <laughs> that, that offer is available to everyone, but God makes that offer through us, through you and me. Now, I often think, God, can't you do it some other way? <laughs> God, can't you just, I don't know, write your name in the sky over Huddersfield? <laughs> Can't you do it some other way? But no, God says, no, you, you're my ambassador, Steve. You're my ambassador. We are Christ's ambassadors. For those of you who read commentaries, there are some misguided souls who say that when Paul says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, he's talking about Paul himself and his, and his team. But I believe, and I think most commentators would agree, when Paul says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, he means the royal we. All of us. The big, the big we. It's not that, you know, there's apostles and Pastor John, he's an ambassador. No, we're, we're all ambassadors. God sends us all. It's quite interesting if you see, what, look what the dictionary 
says about an ambassador. What's an ambassador? Quote, an authorised representative or messenger of the highest rank, get that, sent out on special mission. What a great description for a Christian. <laughs> it, it's probably not the description that many of us would, would start with if someone said, what, what, what is a Christian? But that's a good one. An authorised representative, authorised. Jesus sends us out with authority. And you might just say, oh, it's just a little old me. No, you're an authorised representative. And get this, of the highest rank. No, no, no Steve, no, Pastor John, he's, he's, he's the highest. No, you, we are authorised representative of the highest rank. You are the commanding officer general, whatever the highest rank is. There is no higher rank. You, you can't be of any higher rank. You already are. You're a son and daughter of the living God. You can't get any higher than that. You're an authorised representative or messenger of the highest rank sent out on special mission. Sent out on special mission. We're on a mission. I loved hearing the notices this morning about Yorkshire and telling people on the 23rd, can I come? Can I come on the 23rd? Am I allowed? I want to come on the 23rd. Don't know about the concert. I might be busy, but I want to be there on the street. I love it because we're on a special mission. We're on a mission. And I've chatted to Pastor John. His heart, your heart, is the same as our heart at the art church to tell people of Huddersfield about Jesus Christ and to see the lost saved. We're on a special mission. And our message, Jesus sends us out with a message because an ambassador goes with a message. You see, an ambassador delivers the message of the king. The ambassador doesn't make up his own messages. He'd soon get fired. The, the ambassador represents the king. He, he takes the message of the king to the people. Well, we are authorised representatives of the highest rank of the king of kings. The king of kings. And he sends us out with his message. So we need to know what that message is. And we've looked at it this morning. Our message to people out there is get right with God. Be reconciled with God. The thing that can turn us off sometimes and think we can't do it is because we think, oh, well, I need to tell them about Jesus. I need to tell them about God. I need to tell them about the Holy Spirit. I need to tell them about the Bible. I need to tell them about prayer. I need to tell them about Abraham and Moses. I need to tell them about David. I need to tell them about this, that and the other. And we get so, we think, oh, maybe next time. <laughs> or we miss. No, the message is simple. It's, it's four words. Our message for people out there is four words. Be reconciled to God. Get right with God. Now, that is going to spark, we hope, lots of questions that people will ask. Who is God? How do I get right with God? But that's our message. Get yourself right with God. Be reconciled to God. God. We're on a special mission to bring Jesus, to bring light to the people of Huddersfield. And it's so great to be on special mission with you guys and other believers from the church. Let's just pray together, shall we, this morning. I'm going to pray. I want to pray for us and then I'm going to hand over to, to, to Pastor John. Oh, Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Father, your words would not be without effect this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would come now, bring conviction to our hearts.
And I want to say first thing this morning before the Lord, if, if, if you this morning know that you're not right with God, you, you're just not right with God, I just want you now, in the quietness of your heart, like I did all those years ago, get right with God now, this morning, right now. And whatever it is that is niggling away, that is causing you not to be at peace with God, sort it now, repent. Name it before God, in your prayer now before God. And surrender to Him. And if you're doing business with God right now, just continue. But I just encourage you, just lift your hands before God as a sign of saying, God, I surrender. I'm doing business with you this morning. I'm getting right with you this morning. You're being reconciled to God this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray you come and bring forgiveness into hearts this morning. Lord, you see our hearts, you see our tears this morning, you see everything. We give our lives to you, we surrender to you, sovereign God, holy God. Thank you for forgiveness. We leave our sin on the cross right now. Where Jesus, we know you have dealt with it forever. And Jesus, Holy Spirit, help us as we pick up this, this mantle of an ambassador for you. Jesus, we're, we're sorry for the times when we haven't spoken out, when we haven't told people about you, when we've, we've our light has hardly been shining at all, Lord. We, 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 we ask for your forgiveness. And the Holy Spirit, I pray now, you would come and empower my brothers and sisters to be ambassadors for you. Amb I declare over you this morning, Potter's House Church, I declare over you, you are ambassadors of the highest rank. And I see that, that uh, banner at the back say we're aiming for 50 adults worshipping here. I declare that into being in Jesus' name. Bring them in, Lord. Bring them in, Lord, and use my brothers and sisters here to bring them in. Holy Spirit, I pray for adventures in the Lord in the coming days and weeks. Pray, Lord, for opportunities to speak about you, to speak about God, to speak about the church, to invite people to come. We pray for guests to come next Saturday night. We pray for divine appointments on the streets of Huddersfield next Saturday. We pray for healing. We pray for a demonstration of your power and your might that will cause people to turn to you. And I declare that over Potter's House Church. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.
Hallelujah. Powerful ministry from Pastor Steve. We've been blessed. We've been edified. I genuinely felt the presence of God. And it's just so affirming to hear that each one of us here is an ambassador of the highest rank. You know, we've been appointed, handpicked by God, not just saved for ourselves, but saved to be a testimony to others, to reconcile others to God. Amen. We're going to be on our feet. We're going to close in a song of worship, Purify My Heart. You know, this song, I mean, it's about being right with God, but also ready to do his will. Being ambassadors for him in our town here in Huddersfield, in Leeds, in Yorkshire, in all the areas beyond. So we're going to sing together, Purify My Heart. Let me be as gold, as precious silver as we close this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll lift our hands in worship. Amen. And let's sing together. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Purify my heart, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Purify. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure gold, refine as fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy set apart for you lord i choose to be holy set apart for you my master ready to do your will amen that's our prayer this morning that Lord you would use me give us the grace Lord to be your ambassadors this morning purify my heart Lord amen we'll sing it one more time purify my heart cleanse me cleanse me from my zeal and make me and make me holy purify my heart Cleanse me from my sin, cleanse me from my sin, deep within, deep within, refine as fire, my heart, my heart's one desire, is to be holy, Set apart for you, Lord, I choose to be holy. Set apart for you, my Lord, to be ready, ready to do your Refine as fire, refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose, I choose to be holy, set apart for you my master ready to do your will amen that's our cry that's our prayer this morning that we are ready to do his will amen let's give god a hand of praise this morning father we bless you father we thank you god and we thank you for this enterprise we're involved in thank you for saving us thank you god for reconciling us to yourself 
Father, give us the grace, give us the compassion, God, the boldness, Lord, to now be your ambassadors in Huddersfield and beyond, in Jesus' name. Amen. Saints, we're going to be uh, dismissed. I'll ask Brother Gary to please close us in a word of prayer. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Saints, God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Please let's make Pastor Steve and Ruth feel welcome. Introduce yourselves. Get to know them. They're amazing and we're blessed to have them this morning. But saints, have a wonderful week ahead. God bless you as you go. Amen. Amen.